It's Monday night. We are live from Space Coast Podcast Studios right here in Melbourne, Florida, and this is the Melbourne Mayor Monday Show. So here we go. It is a beautiful Monday night. Mayor, it's always a great time to be in Melbourne. What do you say? Uh, absolutely. You know, Melbourne Mayor Monday, and that's what that's what makes Monday special. I mean, we know we all hate Mondays, but, you know, I figured we'd lighten it up and probably come on our worst day and, and, <laughs> and talk about something. So I love I love our podcast. Jesse Hall, you're the man. Thank you for oh, producing this. Huh? You're too kind, man. No, you're no, thank kind. you. No, seriously, thank you for producing this. Yeah. You know, we get a lot of, as, as in the mayor's office, you get a lot of questions. You get a lot of communication coming at you. And, uh, you know, a lot of times it's good just to put this stuff out and, and try to get some interaction with our residents and kind of answer the questions. And, you know, a lot of times you see some of the same questions over and over, which is which is okay. Um, but a lot of times, you know, you want some of the experts to answer those questions. And we have a great expert tonight. You know, uh, we have my friend, Dr. Lisa Soto with the Marine Resources council um we're going to talk about a very hot topic tonight which is the indian river lagoon and the recent report card that came out um i will say before we move into that um you know city of melbourne me and my council were very uh set on on trying to do as much as we can with the indian river lagoon um we have issues there we know we have issues and you know it's going to take a, a while to get this right but i, I believe you know, through our, you know, some of our experts have said, we'll get there. It's just, you know, it, it, it's a lot of changes and all that's got to happen. So I'm going to turn over real quick about to, or to D- Dr. Soto, and she can tell us about herself and about the Marine Resources Council. Hey, good evening, hey, Doc. Thank you so much for having me, Mayor. It's great to be here. And thank you, audience out there, for, for listening in. Um, my name is Lisa Soto. I'm the Executive Director of the Marine Resources Council. We're a charitable organization that has been dedicated to bringing this community together to unite for our coastal community, our precious Indian River Lagoon. Uh, for over 30 years so Mm -hmm. we have been your lagoon uh, organization for decades and we appreciate everything that you're doing every day uh, to help us bring our lagoon back to health yeah and you know last week jesse and i came up uh my good friend wes morrison up in uh and and cape canaveral the mayor there mayor morrison he uh you know you were up there presenting and i know you notice you do a lot of presenting you talk you're going everywhere and and a little bit about Mm -hmm. the lagoon when we talk about the lagoon we're talking about multiple counties correct oh yes yeah we cover uh, mrc covers the entire lagoon a lot of people don't realize it covers almost 40 percent of florida's east coast wow it goes all the way from volusia county down to palm beach county uh, 157 miles long and includes the six inlets um, and you know really hundreds of watershed acres that all drain into the Indian River Lagoon. It's a huge area. It goes inland all the way to Orlando. And you know wow. what, what's cool is when you go, you see your building right uh, just south of Melbourne, uh, the big, the big, pretty light blue building there on the on the water, and that that's your that's your uh, that's your your place, right? We are so fortunate to uh, be at the Lagoon House. It's located in the city of Palm Bay, a mile south of the Melbourne Causeway. Mm-hmm. A lot of people think it's a restaurant. They see that big blue building and they're like, "Oh, is that a restaurant?" We actually thought about making it a restaurant at one point, but no, that's our office, and we have a beautiful education center there, and we're you know just reopening now to the public. We do our summer camp there. We've got all kinds of, of youth and adult presentations there. We're turning it into a sustainable campus. We're showing everybody how to do LID as a demonstration, and also we're doing um, alternative shoreline restoration projects where we're using all inert materials to build oyster reef and no plastic. Yeah, and I noticed that in, in the last, uh, up here in Canaveral, last week you you're, you also do camps for the children right right yeah this summer we'll be doing a lagoon castaway camp we're actually doing ones we do four different sessions it's for uh, youth age 8 to 13 oh. so we do two different groups we'll break the kids up into, into age groups and then we've got two sessions where they're actually going to do like um survivor you know okay. where, you, where you have to like try to figure out how you would survive if you were a castaway in the oh. lagoon so that should be really fun for the kids oh that that's pretty neat that's something for and also it teaches our children uh the more uh, about the lagoon and, and the importance of of the uh of, of the sanctuary it's it, so i i saw that and i'm like eh, that's pretty neat you're, you're you're throwing that in as well so you guys do a lot there tell also oh, yeah. tell me about your board and 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 really how you operate etc can you tell me more about that sure well we're we're a, a nonprofit, mm-hmm. so we have a board of directors that oversees our, our kind of make sure that we're fiduciarily uh, responsible okay. uh, so they 
you know they're our o- oversight board and they also assist with fundraising and all that kind of stuff where we have board members we have 18 board members they range from um you know aides of congressmen to uh retired uh engineers and okay. uh, stormwater people and all, all different types of people on the board of directors Okay, uh, excellent. And and uh, as we move forward also, Doc, I want to thank you because I remember a while back, you remember when the city of Melbourne, uh, I was actually a councilman at the time when we were having the water issues and, and, and uh, that's one thing we were talking about, the biosolids issue. And, you know, you were, you were definitely, uh, you know, out there pushing that, look, something needs to be done with our waterways. You are an amazing uh, advocate for not only our lagoon, but our waters and, and, you know, that's your background. And, and it was kind of refreshing to see experts that are really feet on the you know feet on the ground. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, any issues that I've seen regarding fish kills or whatever, it's terrible. But you're out there. I mean, you're 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 you and your team. Thank you, and I, I want to thank you because if you wouldn't know I was out there if you weren't out yeah. there. So it's great to have somebody like yourself in a position of leadership that's taken such an active role in finding out and troubleshooting the issues. I was so impressed, Mayor, when we had that, you probably don't recall, but there was a, a tiny fish kill in the Melbourne Harbor of anchovies, mm-hmm. thousands, t- tens of thousands, and they, they it hit the news, and you, you called me immediately, yeah. and you're like, do you know what happened? Yeah. Like, you wanted to make sure it wasn't something the city had done, and it wasn't. So I really respect you for that, because yeah. um, that's not something you hear every day. And I always welcome uh, new elected officials and people in leadership. You know, once you get into office, if you want to know what's going on with the lagoon, by all means, reach out to me. I'm nonpartisan uh, and I'm a scientist, so I'll just kind of say it as it is and uh, and bring you up to date on some of the issues. So I welcome that opportunity, especially for people just coming into the area or into office. I I welcome the chance to to answer questions you may have. Well, when when you come into office, even like the mayor's role, there's so much coming at you, whether it's roads, it's bridges, it's parks and rec. There's so much communication. And, you know, the lagoon is is forefront in everybody's mind. And you really need the experts in your ear. And, you know, it's really my policies and what I'm trying to do and bring the city into low-impact development. We'll get a little bit. We're going to have Chris on next week to discuss. You guys work with uh, him uh, on low-impact development to kind of get an idea of pineapple avenue uh, low impact development is, is it's a multiple multiple stages but one is bringing the water and and instead of pushing it to the lagoon trying to get it good to go down where it is permeable pavers flower boxes stuff that keeps the water from from going uh going down the lagoon and flushing all the debris um we're you know i today i signed a um a letter uh, to Governor DeSantis. Uh, we have a, a Spring Creek water quality project. Uh, me and my council, we are really big on this. This is a massive project. This is almost a $2.6 million project. It's going to be around the O'Galley area, Spring Creek. Um, um, it's going to be part pipe replacement, baffle boxes, um, and fortunately, State Representative Randy Fine, uh, um, Senate Majority Leader Debbie Mayfield, they were they were pushing this. Uh, I know it was uh, Mr. Fine, I believe Bill, but you know th- the the state has uh, 1.3 million dollars of money that they're approving. It looks like it's going to be signed. So the ability to have uh, this kind of big kind of project, because you and I both know, uh, and you kind of were educating even me last week on the nitrogen and phosphorus. Kind of tell us what that does and what the baffle box does. Would you go into that? Oh, I'd love, to, I'd be happy to. So, and the report card, and I'll talk about it in reference to the report card. Um, in our report that MRC does every year, at least for the past four years, we've taken the state's monitoring data, which is really focused on nitrogen, phosphorus, chlorophyll A, which is a measure of algae, and turbidity, which is how clear or unclear the water is. Those four water quality parameters, and then Seagrass are the five things that the state measures. So the state's whole pretty much water quality improvement program is is around nitrogen and phosphorus. Mm -hmm. So that's what everybody monitors for. And the reason that they're so important is because they're they are nutrients that feed everything and they feed algae. So when there's too much nitrogen and phosphorus going into the water, it dissolves, it adds it to the water column. Now it's dissolved nutrients. And what likes to take up dissolved nutrients? Algae does. So all of that nitrogen and phosphorus is fuel, fueling these al- algal blooms, algae blooms. And then once they start, like we had our first, what we called the super bloom in 2010, 
we had no idea what a super bloom was yet. <laughs> that was the, the what we thought was a huge algae bloom. We've had so much bigger blooms since then. But once they start, they cycle. And you kind of like, it's almost like it's gone into a new system and they kind of feed each other. So that's where we are. We're in a super bloom status where we're getting algal blooms every year that are going for longer than they should. They're enduring through the winter, which is very unusual. And they're, you know, they're all super blooms now. We've got so many new species, like the algae scientists are all excited. Their life's work is coming to realization. They can identify all these new species of algae in the lagoon. Not good for us, but great for the algae scientists. Um, so that's why nitrogen and phosphorus are so important because they feed algae. Algae blocks the sunlight, so turbidity goes up. And now the seagrasses cannot grow because they don't get any sunlight because the water is too dark, too cloudy, and everything is being blocked. And you, you all, if anybody has been here for any length of time, you've seen the lagoon flip all different colors. It's gone from like mocha latte shades of brown to like bright green, almost like a seaweed milkshake to, you know, you notice it's all food with me yeah. <laughs> to like different levels of right. uh, reds and oranges. I don't know right. what that, what food that goes with, but it's, these are all like certain types of algae or zooplankton or they're blooming in the bajillions of cells. And they're just, uh, they're in a cycle now. So we're getting these algae blooms. That what we found in the report card, if I could continue. Uh, no, it's, you, you're on. Is, uh, <laughs> you got to continue. You're stuck here. It's like <laughs> Hotel California. You can check out, but you can never leave. <laughs> and there's no wine. <laughs> um, but uh, so what we found this year was actually a little bit of good news in that the water quality score in throughout the lagoon in every single region has improved. In some cases, it's gone up like 25 points. Water quality has improved. In other areas, small increments, but improvement across the board. And it's because the water clarity has gotten so much better the past year. Um, so now we're just kind of hoping that the seagrasses are gonna come back because even the water quality improved from like 2017 to 2020, right. we didn't see any seagrass improvement. So we're not sure. We think maybe something else besides the the lack of sunlight, which is what explained the loss of seagrass. Sunlight is going is coming back to the bottom. It's be able to reach the bottom because the water's clearer, yet the seagrasses aren't coming back. So what else is preventing the seagrasses from coming back? That's kind of where we are. Okay, interesting. So um, if you could, there, put up the, uh, uh, put up, put up uh, what she had last week, uh, the graph. Uh, that was very interesting. Oh, there it that, is. that the qual water quality and very habitat good. quality scores. Um, go over that. That was interesting on that. And again, you kind of kind of touched on that with the seagrass, but how they kind of they're they're kind of uh, in sync. Sure. So the what you're looking at on the screen right now is is uh, the scores for water quality, which is an average of those four parameters: nitrogen, phosphorus, turbidity, and chlorophyll A. And the scores for, and that's the blue line, the solid blue line is the score over the 26 years of data. Okay. And then the reddish or orange colored line is the scores for seagrass over the same time frame. Actually, there's a couple more years of seagrass data. And then the dotted lines are the trend. So if you were to put a line like an average okay. through those scores, that's what it would look like. And so what you can see, there's a couple things is one, you can kind of see that the two relate to each other, that when the blue line goes up, the red line goes up, and then when the blue line goes down, the red line goes down, except that since 2016 or so, the red line just keeps going down, and the blue line is kind of going up and down, but heading in the up direction, and that a lot of that improvement in water quality has to do with clarity okay. specifically. So water clarity is improving, and yet seagrasses aren't returning. And the trend lines really tell the story. And what's shocking is that when you look at the water quality trend, it doesn't really, it's pretty flat. Yeah. It doesn't really do anything. It's kind of slightly going down. If you can, you know, there is a, there's a gradient to it. You can't even see it. You'd have to do the, the marble e test, the equation yeah. <laughs> right. to figure it out. But there is one. It's slightly going down, but yeah. the, you can easily see the decline in seagrass trend you can easily see that that line is precipitously going down okay so and that's the issue that's the phenomenon we're trying to figure out now and and of course that that's in correlation with the manatee deaths i'm sure because the grass I and mean, what what do you what do you feel with that in the correlation i mean that that's yeah. probably a tough question oh well the correlation well there's not there's not uh that the population data is not on here to really correlate. Right. But I'll, I'm going to talk about that for a second. There's one more point I'd like to make about this. Yes, absolutely. There's a green line that's not appearing, but up there at the score of 80 is where 
the healthy target is. So what we're actually comparing with the report card is the state's healthy targets of what those values should be and the actual condition. So, so that's at 80, right? That should be about 80. We set the target at 80. So we said, well, if you're meeting the, the state's criteria, it's a B because okay. it can be better than that because it's always a compromise with any okay. kind of regulatory. So you can see that even in this graph, there were times what we call the mid-aughts, like 2006, 2007, that across the lagoon, we were exceeding standards. We were exceeding our seagrass standards. We were doing great in the mid-aughts. We were like patting ourselves on the back, right. mission accomplished, we're done. And then 2010 we, is when we got the first super bloom. So since now I'm going to get to your question about the manatees. Yeah. In 2010, also here, we started seeing our first marine, uh, excuse me, our marine mammal mortality events okay. were occurring. And it happened both with manatees and dolphins. And they were dying of a toxicity. It wasn't like it is now. So back then it was dolphins, manatees, and diving birds. And you guys remember that? Like the yeah. diving birds were like literally falling out of the sky. They were just wow. like tox, you know, dying instantly and falling wow. at the shore. We're like, what is going on with all these animals? So that was the super bloom cyanobacteria. It's very toxic algae. Right. And so we suspect that there was toxicity from that. Okay. So since then we lost 97% of the seagrasses in the lagoon. God, so everything is starving to death and it's not. So now the manatee mortality event is about starvation. They started starving last winter as temperatures drop, you know, things can survive. You know, if you've got low body weight or your, you know, calorie intake is low, you do okay in the summer when it's warm, then when you get chilled is when you start to you know, experience loss of life. So last, um, you know, winter, sadly, in Brevard County alone, I think we lost over 300 wow. manatees. And this winter, since Jan between January and the end of February, we'd already lost 300 manatees in Brevard. Wow. So it's actually worse this year in our region than it was last year. But statewide, it's not as bad. So it's not getting as much press coverage right. as last year. Because we're not, you know, last year, as I predicted, we lost one sixth of the manatee population wow. in the state. So, like, how many years can we lose a sixth of the population? Yeah, it's terrible. I mean, that, that's that. You know, when you hear about that, it's just, you know, shake your head and you, you think, what, 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 what can we do? Well, I, I know that we are doing things, and and I know that, you know, we we decided as Bavard County to tax ourselves with the half cent sales tax, and I know the projects are. There's a lot of projects. I think we're up. Uh, we uh, we're probably near a hundred projects that are completed and are work being worked on and in and in, in, in engineering. So uh, so you know with all these projects getting done, it's just unfortunately going to take time. Um, right. What what what's your thought on that? Do you believe that that it's going to take time? Well, I think restoration takes a long time. I think that our estuary is very resilient mm -hmm. and it's managed to maintain for a long time when it was being polluted. Okay. And then it flipped, and now it's going to take us a long time to flip it back. But I, I think it's perfectly possible, and it's just going to take some time, and we're heading in the right direction. And that's kind of my message, which you heard right, when I yes. do the report card. It's keep doing what we're doing better, you know, implement more, and then, you know, just kind of stay the course. We do need to figure out a few things, like what is killing the seagrass. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the manatees. And, yes, the manatees will eat it if they can find it. Uh, but, you know, yeah. there's some real challenges there, you know, so that's why we're planning a seagrass assembly to bring the best seagrass experts together in a room to kind of brainstorm, churn away on that. I mean, we've mm. got issues bigger than one that any one entity can deal with. We've got to figure out not only how do we restore seagrass, how do we plant it and how do we keep everything from eating it? And it's not just the manatees. It's the pinfish. It's the sea turtles. It's the sh you know, it's a, a thousand different organisms organisms that eat the seagrass that then feed the rest of the food chain right right absolutely um and now going into um well one thing we'll talk about real quick on the baffle boxes um the baffle boxes are something that the city of melbourne we're really focusing on get doing these baffle boxes and they're multi-stages you know they collect all the garbage um and the idea is to keep the uh the water from just rushing the from the lagoon because you know all canals leave to the indian river lagoon and and everything's cleaned it picks up the uh, nitrous the phosphorus our our crews go out they clean the baffle boxes so we're getting a lot of these installed um you know the uh the spring creek baffle box will be a a real 
real uh, big for the city of Melbourne. Again, I want to give a big shout out to my council, you know, uh, Mark LaRusso, Tim Thomas, Julie Sanders, I mean, Debbie Thomas. I mean, you guys are great. Yvonne Minus, Mimi Hanley, thank you all for, for really stepping up on that. And that's something that's very important. And really, and also uh, the experts at the Marine Resource Council, because, um, you know, being being in local government, you got to pick and choose where the money goes. And I think we're, we're at... Uh, you know, all sirens are on for the lagoon. So, yeah, definitely, I, 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 I can't stress that enough. Now, thank you, we, thank you we, for what you're doing. Yeah, it's we, important. we've had some questions, and maybe you know, if we try to answer, if anybody has any questions out there on the lagoon, we'll take questions. One of the questions we saw earlier is why is it the water cleaner down in Vero yeah, we saw than that. it is here? That was a good question. Mm -hmm. What do you yeah. think? What do you think about that, Doc? There's, there's a lot of things that they're doing right in Indian River County. Um, well, first, I mean, this isn't necessarily something they've done, but let's just recognize they have way fewer people in Indian River County right. than most of the other counties. They've only got about 150,000 in the entire county, you know, versus, I mean, we have 100,000 in just the city of Melbourne, right? Yeah. About. So, you know, we've got way more people, which means way more pollution and way more stormwater. And we've got a section of the lagoon that's got an island right in the middle of it. So there's a lot of stagnation areas where water just settles, sits there, and doesn't uh, flush out, so to speak. I hate to use the flush word. <laughs> but um, uh, Indian River has they've done a couple things right. From the get-go, two of their main sources of freshwater inflow have got harvesting devices on them. So when you've got canals bringing in polluted water, it's good to cut off the algae and the floating vegetation before it ever gets to the lagoon. So they've, they're doing that, which is fantastic. They're not spraying herbicides and letting it all die and sink to the bottom and rot like a lot of people are treating their canals. They're actually harvesting the vegetation out. That's removing right. all that nutrients out of the water. It's the best way to do it is to get a vegetation to take the nutrients and then get the vegetation out. So that was a great thing. The other thing is if you're a sailor or a boater and you go down the ICW and you look in Brevard, you're going to find seawalls on both sides. That's a huge energy problem we've got to deal with in Brevard County. And I'm talking about wave energy. It starts bouncing back and forth. So right now the seagrasses may not be coming back in Brevard because the bottom is too unsettled. Because everything, the energy is going back and forth like this and it's stirring up the bottom and seagrasses cannot right. settle and grow if everything's right. moving down there. If, you, if you're in Indian River County and look on both sides, what do you see? Mangroves. Mangroves. Yep, mangroves. So they didn't rip out all their mangroves and put seawalls in. That was really smart of them. Mm -hmm. uh, so that makes a huge difference. They've, of course, also got an inlet. Mm -hmm. um, we know that the inlet has a very, very localized effect, only about five acres, and that's according to Dr. Zarillo's model. Um, and even after 2010 Superbloom, they lost all their seagrass. So the inlet didn't save their seagrass but their seagrass is coming back, so what are they doing differently? Um, the other uh, point about inlets is down at the far south end of the lagoon, down at St. Lucie Estuary, where St. Lucie Inlet is, and the Jupiter Inlet, two inlets close to each other, very high energy. Mm. They don't have any seagrass. So they have great water quality, but they still have no seagrass. ecology. So the, the inlet is not saving the seagrass down in St. Lucie. So inlets are not just the solution. They are not the solution. They are a something they do something but they don't necessarily solve all of our water quality issues okay. um, so there are a lot of things they've done right in indian river county um, and like i said population and the difference in the number of people that live there really is key to it but the mangroves um, some of their canal restoration activities that they're doing um, now now they're working hard on the septic to sewer conversion Yep, um, we're doing a lot so of that now. The septic, the sewer, the money is there for the septic, the sewer. Excellent. Um, right. Yeah, we're definitely doing that. Um, also, the mangroves, that's something that we need to focus on replanting. You know, that's we really got to get kicked that in gear. You know, you also hear some people talk about, you know, doing, you know, an oyster or something like that. What, what's your thought on that? Doing oysters? Yeah, oyster or yeah, clams or what, whatever. Well, what, what's your thought? I mean, what? I think that the more habitat we can get in the lagoon, the better. I think that it would be beneficial to do some scientific studies and evaluate the best locations to put those restoration projects. Right. I kind of feel like, you know, a lot of uh, people uh, want just to, you know, get work done and get, you know, boots on the ground or whatever you want to call that, Let's get some projects implemented. They don't want to wait for the science to direct it. So it becomes a convenience thing. Wherever it's convenient to put oysters, let's put them there. Okay, well, then what if they don't work, how do you know what killed them, right? So if you have a model or some kind of a 
study of viability, like where is it likely that oysters are going to survive, or I don't mean to pick on oysters, clams, mm -hmm. sea squirts, whatever it is, mm -hmm. seagrass. We're going to do one for seagrass for sure. Um, so you do a model that set, gives you a, a, a map that says it's likely based on salinity, temperature, depth, blah, 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 seagrass is going to survive here. So then we plant it there and it survives. Good, the model worked. If it doesn't, they were like, hey, we tried all of this. It looked like it was supposed to survive. Why didn't it? Right. So right. if you at least have a hypothesis, right, you have a, something that you're testing it against, then you have a scientific question. You can see, did it work or did it not work? Right. And it's that may, like just that, throwing that, stuff out there and then being like, it, 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 they're all dead. Okay, next. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I know, and I noticed it's very too, difficult. Yeah. And, and I noticed too uh, what the Marine Resource Council does to, uh, too. It, it helps get all the cities on board. Um, you talk about the classes that you put on for the elected officials, you know, to make the right decisions on low impact development. I mean, a lot of people when they get in office, you know, they're very, you know, they they understand some stuff, but there's a lot more that goes on. And even with the lagoon, I mean. We're not all, you know, biologists like you, Doc. Um, you know, and so the decision makers really have to, to, to uh, be on to really make those changes. And one of the things, like the city of Melbourne, I mean, I, I uh, when Chris came before us and talked about low impact development, it was kind of supposed to be a three minute speech. And I'm like, no, 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 time out. You're going to get with our staff and we're going to do this. We're going to get this right. You know, we're going to make some changes and we're going to follow, you know, Satellite Beach works hard. I know, you know, up up in Canaveral works hard. They got amazing staff and everybody's starting to get on board. And I think, yeah, I think that's, that's what we have to do. So. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. I thought it was great that, you know, we did the Low Impact Development Conference, yep. was well attended, and and then immediately afterwards, you, like, called on Chris, who was at the conference, to come and talk to you in a very meaningful way about where can we implement projects in the city. Right. I mean, it, it, was, it wasn't, you know, just like, oh, we're going to think about doing an ordinance or we're going to, you know, move in that direction. It was like, bring in the guy who knows yeah. Yeah. and have him tell us, look at what we're trying to deal with. What can we implement where? That was very decisive. Well, and one of the things I've tried to do in Melbourne is make, you have, you have to make changes. And a lot of times staff, we have a great staff, but the staff goes by the book and you know that it you know hey this is how we do things um when i got on council mural what murals wasn't the, wasn't even allowed and and you know, that was changed and we you know and so so making those changes and and no permeable pavers and and stuff like right. that it's got to that's being changed and really you have to kind of force it down staff and say this is what the council wants and i'm just very blessed because i got a supportive council that says hey these are the experts here and and you know you know government is kind of old and musty and these are this is all that this is what's really working so again I, I appreciate our partnership with the marine resource council you know to me um it's easy to to would be easy to put on something on social media you know we did this project and you know everything's great but the reality is sometimes if you want to be effective in office you got to put the real report card out i mean that that's a reality and you know it really hurts me to look at this report card and say you know this has got to change and and you know nobody likes it and it's easy to it's easy to throw insults out and uh, you get them too doc and you know you you get insulted and, and i'm shocked because your heart is is gold when it comes to the lagoon i mean people people have their own opinions and and everybody has an opinion we're allowed to have one uh, but we just got to remember that we all have to work together and and, and uh we're not all right and we're not all wrong so but this kind of go down the report card with us and as, as hard as it is to do this i think it needs to be done thank you thank you mayor and you bring up a really good point about low impact development and the staff so the next one, so the first conference that we held back in October was just kind of presenting what it is and then bringing forth the resources and experts like Chris uh, that people can tap. So here, is, here are some products, here are some people, here are some concepts, here's some language, here's an overview. Mm -hmm. The next one, and we recognize exactly what you're saying, that a lot of the limitation in, Im in implementing low impact development is in the city code or in the existing staff perceptions. So. If, if it's about changing code, changing ordinances, or, or making the process changes to accommodate staff doing the right thing, then that needs to happen next. So we're doing that next. The next conference is about the same time. We're talking about October 2022. We'll bring Evan Bean, you remember him, from mm -hmm. the University of Florida. He's got a tool that he is going to test out where people can self-audit their own land development regs. 
their own building codes, or you can hire a consulting firm or, or somebody. I don't know if MRC is going to get into that or not, but um, somebody to come in and do that for you, where you can use a toolbox that he's he and his team are creating uh, that really makes it easy for any city or county, municipality, town to go through it and just check the boxes, going through their transportation corridor codes, their green infrastructure codes, their stormwater infrastructure, the land development regs, their zoning changes processes, and so on to really be comprehensive in how do we truly accommodate a different way of building on the land that's going to reduce the amount of stormwater, polluted stormwater from entering right. our estuary. You know, I hear sometimes, you know, you, you people say, look, you know, you're, you, it's this development that is coming on. That The new development is responsible for the old lagoon or <laughs> lagoon being damaged. Um, I don't really necessarily agree with that. Um, if you look at the regulations now, uh, they're required to keep all the stormwater on site. You no longer can just push it into the lagoon. Um, one of them is like, for example, the Margaritaville. If you think about the old marina with the old tanks and, and everything from U.S one you know when it rains the streets look very good they look clean that's because everything just got shoved right down in the damn lagoon i right. mean that that's being realistic and and, and that's being realistic on that and and that's why you know these new developments and stuff like that they have interest they have they have financial interest to have a clean lagoon because we all know that margaritaville is no good if it's got a nasty dirty lagoon so you know one of the things that we push is i want newer development that holds the storm water in that that you know that that uh, is a partner in the lagoon uh, cleaning the lagoon so you understand that I sure do and getting like you said getting it the, the rainwater into the ground where it lands yeah. not piped off to <clears throat> a lot of those ponds only temporarily hold water they have overflows so the yeah. next rain event that pond is now accumulated and probably created more nitrogen and then now that's going to overflow they actually enrich nitrogen they do remove phosphorus which is one of the things baffle boxes are really good at also. Baffle boxes are great at removing phosphorus. Nitrogen is always the hard little monster to deal right. with. That's, a, that's interesting. That, 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 uh, and, and if you look at, like, for example, you know, this, this is uh, the Spring uh, Creek Water Quality Project that we're doing. I mean, they're talking about this box will serve an area of 110 plus or minus acres. Wow. So we're talking about that's 110 huge. acres in the city of Melbourne that does not – that is was done under the old um regulations you would say this you know so the stormwater regulations that are that are really caused the issues with the lagoon 110 acres this will serve that and it's talking removing approximately 1050 pounds per year of total nitrogen and 231 pounds of of total phosphorus i mean that's a lot and that's one baffle box and it, you know you know we have other baffle boxes we have we have right now over a dozen baffle boxes, um, and we have more. We have the Esp Espinola Cherry. This is a Spring Creek Grant Place uh, Thrush uh, Sherwood. We we the Sherwood we ribbon cutted that. That was a nice one because that's got the big rain that's pond the giant in it. One, right? That uh, no, actually that's not the giant one. That's the one with the double rain pond. Uh, the yeah the the giant one uh, yeah the the giant one that one we made I think made national news didn't oh, it yeah it was I oh. think you said you could see it from space <laughs> wow <laughs> I don't know about all that maybe, I was well maybe Elon <laughs> can but yeah maybe Elon can but we definitely can you know um, so these are just some of the things the the sewer uh, the the septic to sewer conversion, the money's there. I know we're doing a lot of them right there on uh, right off US one. Uh, those are being done. So let me ask you, Doc, if if what would you tell your home if if Joe homeowner, regular homeowner, said what can I do to, as a homeowner to um, limit my impact toward the Indian River Lagoon? What would you tell them? Oh, there's so many things. Uh oh, so, we got time. Good, I, <laughs> we have time. So the easy one is. Stop fertilizing your lawn. Mm -hmm. That's the easy one. But that's and controversial. Everybody wants a green lawn. Everything is controversial. I know. Yeah. Right? So stop and see what happens. It might right. still be green. Right. Yeah. So at least stop. Like just stop and see what happens. Well, there is a moratorium uh, on on high nitrogen phosphate, uh, phosph yeah, phosphate yes. um, fertilizers that Tell comes around that. every uh, rainy season. Yeah. You know, so you know if, if people were to just abide by that they said that that would that would definitely help because you you literally fertilize and the next day it rains or it rains it's right. great and it doesn't have time to even penetrate your soil and you're in your it just wastes money and not only that but all that fertilizer that goes straight to the lagoon 
uh, down your driveway, down the sidewalk into the storm drain, and, and that was perfect. Yeah, thank I've, you. I've done some. <laughs> I've done some things. You know, I, 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 I'm not. I'm not sure. You know how much my input is is going to be. Um, you know, uh, tolerated. You know tonight, but I, <laughs> I have lived on islands, um, including Santa Bell. You know, and. Uh, in there, they have a lot of uh, xeriscaping. Yes. You know, lots of shell lawn, mm -hmm. sand lawn, rock lawn, paver lawn, like anything else but lawn. Um, even even uh, uh, fake turf, like a little astroturf or something equivalent. And uh, and everybody kind of respects that. And on an island when, you know, you're, you know, just like us, you know, we have a good tourism industry, I believe. People want to fish and you know go go to the river, boat on the river, go to the ocean, swim in the ocean. Um, it's our it's our uh, it's kind of like our you know our responsibility. It's 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 our challenge to keep our coastlines and and bodies of water nice and pristine for for our visitors and, and not only that but you know generations. Well, right, I, right. I look at it as mayor. I grew up here. I remember mm -hmm. being growing up here in Sherwood Park and. You know, I, I went uh, Horse Creek right there. Just it, that's just south of uh, Post Road, and that's mm -hmm. when I've caught my first largemouth bass, and I was like seven years old. But I remember I was scared to go in the lagoon because all the grass and all the creatures were in the lagoon. And as a kid, you know, that the big fish there really probably wasn't. But mm -hmm. but you know, I I, I kind of look at it now, and I go, you know, it is my responsibility as mayor to get it back for our children and try to get it what it what it is. So mm -hmm. you're definitely, and I and I I promise you, you're going to see. Some aggressive policies out of Melbourne that that mirror some of the other cities. Um, uh, probably, hopefully, uh, you know, secede them, and and uh, that we can definitely um, do something with the lagoon. Because if you look at the map, we're like dead center. We're like we're kind of like stuck. We're dead center. We don't have an inlet. You know, it's and it and really, if you look at the uh, report card, it's dead about dead center where where we are. And so we have to definitely do some uh, on the homeowners. What else? What else could you do besides yeah, that? I've been I've been encouraging people to just learn something new. Go to our website, savetheirl.org. There's a there's a tab. You know, at the top, you know, what can you do? And there's a whole bunch of things. It kind of depends on how much time you want to spend and where you want to do your activities. So there's you know easy solutions about like making. So just think about your yard as. It being directly connected to the lagoon. Anything you do outside, pressure washing, washing your car, applying chemicals, herbicides, pesticides, cleaning your roof, painting, anything that happens outside is going to end up washing off into the storm drain and going into the lagoon. So instead of washing your car on the driveway, wash it on your lawn. And now right. the soap is actually nutrients and it'll soak into the lawn and fertilize your lawn. There you go. You don't have to fertilize your lawn. Just wash your car on it. Solve two problems at right. once. Right. Or if you don't, if you can't get on your lawn or you don't want to do that, take it to a car wash. Just that soapy water going down the driveway, down the road, into the storm drain is all phosphorus. That's just nit you know nutrients going into the lagoon. Are, are there better alternatives to soap? Are there like uh, environmental friendly soaps maybe? to wash a car with oh I d there probably are yeah. but they they're just going to have something else in them right right you know um let me let me let me throw something at you doc uh put you on the hot seat a little bit i remember last week during our during your presentation in in canaveral um when we had a good turnout there you mentioned yeah. something about pumping water in do you rem recall that about maybe an option of pumping water in um, and I know you don't like to w use the word flush, but the flush okay. out the Do you remember that? I Can do. Can you kind of go into that? Okay. Um, so what the mayor's talking about is the FIT study, right? Okay. The FIT study. Okay. So the Florida Tech has been investigating, and this part of it is Dr. Zarilla, who I talked about, who modeled the impact of the, of the inlet, the Sebastian Inlet, and noticed that it was such a small area, five acres. Okay. Same team is investigating the feasibility of instead of opening an inlet at the port or opening the locks at the port putting a one-way pump that would take water from the port and put it into kind of the north banana river okay so the th the feasibility of that was was more likely than opening an inlet which you know i don't think anybody politically is in a position to okay that there's right, not gonna right. be any more inlets in florida that's been declared a long time ago and they're just too expensive to maintain and right. all the beach nourishment and that's a long story but um but this idea of you know what would it what would happen to the ecology 
of the Banana River if we just started pumping a one-way flow of water into the banana from the port? You know, it's interesting. A little while back, I actually met, um, I was talking to uh, Representative uh, Thad Altman, and he was, he was, he has, he has some map from I think like the 20s or something that shows where the water would, the, where the water would come over where Patrick is now and and he was talking about a feasibility study on on and that's probably where that came in University of Florida about pumping the water and so I'm wondering I have to get with him but you know I kind of try to meet with the elected officials especially the ones been around and look no get sorry Thad but you've been around a long time you know longer than me but he's been around a long time and he's seen you know <laughs> he's seen that and he's got a lot of information and uh, you know that's something that hopefully that that study will come back because I I believe you know, it won't hurt. It wouldn't. It wouldn't hurt because you have to really kind of flush it out. You do. You have to flush it out. Uh, as much you don't. You want to use the F word, the F bomb, but you have to. <laughs> but that's just my opinion. But I'm not an expert. I'm, I'm not the biologist like you. Yeah, I don't know what that would look like. So if we were to open it up, so the banana is full of muck. I mean, like feet. We've got yeah. nine feet of muck in some places in, wow. in the Banana River. Wow. We don't want muck on our beach, so we don't want it to be, ever be two-way flow okay. into the mm-hmm. banana because there's a chance, right, that something's going to come in and suck that muck out into that'd the be, beach. Be and now we've got our yeah. near shore reefs covered in muck and our beaches, and yeah, that's going to be no – like we've already taken a huge tourism hit. We don't need to destroy yeah. our beaches too. So the one-way flow idea, I just don't see it having enough energy – probably not to get nine feet of muck off the bottom so if it's about like muck removal we're gonna have to de we're gonna have to take that out it's Mm -hmm. gonna have to be an engineering vacuum muck removal project and you know how expensive those are well you know and and fortunately spending time in the the coast guard you know on the on the boats you know you go in and out of these uh you know uh you go in and out uh and you see the energy of the water how much water actually moves in and it moves out and it would take a a massive pumps and again like you would it work maybe for a small area but there's so much water in that lagoon right it's going to be difficult i i I personally think it's on some of the cities in the county to really it multiple stages number one uh city of melbourne has done we don't we don't we haven't had any not and i'll knock on wood we haven't had any you know uh dumps in the lagoon we can't be putting anything in the the lagoon like um wastewater we don't do anything like that that can't be done And and i told our staff that is totally unacceptable um so we need to prepare uh we've we've uh upgraded our 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 wastewater plants to ensure that doesn't happen that's step one step two is the baffle boxes let's make sure that we clean you know we clean the stuff from going in the lagoon and the like you said water quality uh and the, i'm sorry water clarity is coming back so i'm hoping the seagrass comes back and it's not yes. something like you said it's something that we don't know because that that's going to be very uh that's going to be tragic so well, it's going to be challenging but we'll figure it out um, so, but we got we got a few more minutes. So tell us uh, our last pitch on the Marine uh, Resources Thank Council. Thank you. I was going to say, can I? Can yeah, I, no, can we want to talk a little pitch to, on no, what's coming up with yes, us. Yeah, ab- absolutely about some Thank of the you. things that that the MRC is doing. So definitely want to encourage you to go to the website, save the IRL dot org. Um, we we do every month. We do a lunch and learn, and we're now having them both at the Lagoon House, which is one mile south of the Melbourne Causeway. Um, and we do them via Zoom, so you can do it as a webinar. The next one is April the 5th. I don't have my readers on. It should be a Tuesday, April yeah. 5th. And it's on organics composting. And our, our partners from Keep Brevard Beautiful are partnering with cities to set up giant compost bins for residents. I didn't know if you were aware of this, but he's going to be talking about this big project on organics composting in Brevard County with cool. Keep Brevard Beautiful. Yeah, and I like that. And uh, I think they're working with the city of West Melbourne initially. Um, And then we've also got our next report card presentation is tomorrow night at the Environmental Learning Center in Indian River County. We're like, I'm on tour now. You're on tour. You're you're the band. You're the band. So so I'm going county to county, and I'll present the report card and talk about their county specifically. And that's where, if you want to hear more about Indian River County, um, you can tune in on that one. Um, our next, uh, the Lagoon Castaway Summer Camp for kids aged 8 to 13. Go to our website and register. I know we've got half of our seats already full. So if you really think your kid would love to do it, um, sign up now so you're not disappointed. And we are doing a, a, something called a Sea Perch, which is a really cool thing. The kids get to build a remote-operated vehicle and then take it out in the lagoon and grab samples with it. Oh, fun. So that'll be really fun. And then, like so, I what's said, What's the age limit? 
Um, age of 13. <laughs> okay. Darn. <laughs> oh, and then. How old are your kids? <laughs> no, no, I'm talking about me personally. Oh. No, I wanna go. <laughs> he's, a big, he's a big kid. He, Jesse's a big kid, aren't you? You might Jesse? be able yeah. to, f- yeah. you know. Maybe I'll be a counselor, maybe. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> camp counselor. You can be a hey, camp counselor. Camp counselor Jesse. I'm going to start calling you that. I've arrived. <laughs> uh, so we're doing the report card tour. Uh, Lunch and Learns are the first Tuesday of every month, so keep looking out for that. And then our big, our Love Our Lagoon celebration, we had to move to November 4. That's going to be our big kind of award celebration and celebrate, you know, all the good people that are working hard for the lagoon. That'll be in November very fun well then also people have the ability when you go to the website uh to be a, to partner with the mrc uh, and, and, and businesses and stuff like that because as you know um you know th- this this is definitely uh it's not it's it's not free it's something that i mean it costs a lot of money to run an organization and and really i can't tell i can't think of a, a better organization that honestly helped me learn as a mayor uh and again you've always when i needed you and i said hey i'm i'm on council i'm a new mayor and i have this issue you picked up the phone and you're right there and so i, I definitely i fully support you and I, and I know the city of melbourne does and again you're getting the elected officials uh, educated on this and so the really the mrc is an amazing organization and i can't thank, thank you guys you. enough uh and and then we're we're going to get to where we need to go we're going to get to a, a clean lagoon we're going to get there with the projects going on the money's there uh last i heard i mean we they can't spend the money fast enough that right. with the project i mean with the construction industry and and getting the projects done i mean everybody's like well do the like once you do more projects they're on the books i think it was like 50 or something that was in engineering and in the process it's pretty pretty crazy but they're you know they're getting done hmm. yeah it is it's it's exciting times um just to clarify you know we are a charitable organization we really do depend on on the community to support us we don't get well, I can't say any money from the Save Our Indian River Lagoon tax, but we get very little, like right. less than ten thousand dollars a year yeah, from wow. that from that tax. So a lot of people think, "Oh, you pass the tax pass, you guys must be rich." I'm like, "The tax pass, that we don't get any of that." There's a lot, and you know what? You can actually go to the Bard County website. The, a lot of that money is still sitting in the fund. I mean, there's oh, a yeah. lot of money there, and it's it's for projects. And a, as they come down the pike, and you know, we have to do matching projects again. This this Spring Creek Water Quality Project, you know, it's one uh, half of it. The state, which again, I, I uh, you know, I want to thank uh, Representative Fine and and and, and Senate uh, Majority Leader Debbie Mayfield and Tom Wright and Dad Altman. I want to thank I want to thank uh, our Tyler, our delegation for push it, yeah. yeah. For push for pushing that um, and and getting at it, so I mean to get 1.3 million dollars from the state and and I know our 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 uh, um, our team, you know, uh, former Senate President Mike Herodopoulos and Jerry Sansom, they they worked behind the scenes and made sure this was got in the budget and and uh, they've been huge and you know a couple years what like a year ago, a year and a half ago, my fellow council member Mark Larusso, he's like, hey, we need to bring this guy on because we're competing around the state. I mean, people don't realize it's like the EDC. There's there's all these there's 67 counties and mm-hmm. there's only so much money and it's my responsibility as elected to our residents is bring as much money, state money as I can to solve the problems here in the city of Melbourne and and you know and 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 Mark said, hey, you know, let's bring in you know. Uh, Mike Herodopoulos as well, and we tag team it, and we've gotten several million dollars uh, over the last couple of years for qual- water quality projects. And uh, I think, I think, hopefully, this one will survive. Uh, the governor won't veto it again. I sent that letter today, and if that's the case, I mean, that's going to be a big win for the city of Melbourne. Fantastic! So. Yeah, that's great work, and it's important. It's it's important for the state to partner with the local. Yeah. government officials to make to make those things happen and to continue to support and give give local governments all the tools that that we need locally to yeah. to do what we need to do to protect our community's quality of life yeah we have a couple questions Rowan, and, and i'll answer them real quick because i try to answer the the resident's question one of the questions from anthony does anyone keep track of the treated wastewater and where it is discharged um i know the minute that is done i know the city has to contact the state uh and you know that's something that it put out in the media um you don't hear much of that lately well you don't hear it in melbourne because it doesn't happen treated uh so what do you do with your treated water where does it go 
Well, there, it, it's either injection well okay. or actually reclaim water. The state requires us to do uh, to get rid of a large majority of reclaim water, and we do that on our golf courses. Mm -hmm. We also sell it back to the residents. So that's something with the treated and reclaim water. That's what we do with that. But uh, I think maybe men also uh, discharging, you know, you know, water. We, we definitely we don't need to be doing that. So. Um, Let's see what other right. questions. Any other questions? And any? a point on if you if you have reclaimed water for your irrigation, you don't need mm -hmm. to fertilize. Did I mention yep. you don't need to fertilize? Right. Don't yeah. need to fertilize, <laughs> especially if you're on reclaimed water, because although the water's treated, it still has a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus in it. Yeah, yeah. The treatment like takes out the bacteria, but mm -hmm. the nitrogen is still in there, or some of it is. You know, and it, it's a big challenge for the city of Melbourne. Just you know, city of Melbourne has fifty about fifty eight thousand water customers, and we make about twenty millions of gallons of water a day. Wow. And think about that for our residents: twenty eight million or twenty million gallons, twenty two million, eighteen million depends on the you know weekend or showers. But I was going to say that's just my kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Think you would allow that I, I think you'd be like turn that water off you know in the, in the, in the coast guard they made six it, minutes they made us take sea showers where you got in you you put the water on you turn it off you soak up then you turn it back on because you're you make your own water when you're out on the ocean so i see you being that kind of person like turn it off and you would probably be a bear It'd be like what are you doing you know just walk in yeah. Yeah, turn it off <laughs> that, that's great well, uh, again, I want to thank everybody today. This this is a this is one that's very important. This will also lead into next week where we're going to discuss low impact development with Chris and some of the um, hopefully some of the things we're going to bring to the city of Melbourne. Uh, again, like Pineapple Avenue, if you see the boxes are coming into downtown Melbourne, the the plant boxes those those aren't really just for looks. Uh, those are, are engineered and designed to keep water oh, where they are. I can't wait to mm -hmm. yeah. see the new plant boxes in downtown. Yeah, those are I nice. And, then, and, I, and I have right now the city staff, they're working on uh, permeable pavers um, where you see a lot of this where, where before in the, you know, it used to be just poor concrete. We got to get away from that. We mm -hmm. have to allow, we have to allow for that. Um, they make like that concrete mesh where the grass can go through. Right. Uh, that, that needs to be some of the surfaces. So we're going to make those changes and we're going to make them soon under my, you know my leadership and Thank we're going to we're going to get this right and the experts have been in my ear and i'm going to listen so that's fantastic and i look forward to downtown melbourne because you know, i live downtown oh yeah so. yeah you live you live downtown <laughs> hey you know you you chose to live in melbourne i appreciate that you know i do too <laughs> So anybody got anything else on this segment? I think we kind of went a, a whole hour. That was pretty pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank no, you. This is exciting. I, thank you, Doctor. I just yeah. Well, th thank again, you both for thank you me. and the MRC and, and and my fellow council and the state and everybody. And you know, see you next week on low impact development. But I want to thank everybody for for tuning in. It's gonna yeah. be a great one. Save I'm, the they, IRL. Yeah, that's right. Save the IRL dot org is where yes. they could visit more. Okay, mm -hmm. so so we have that disclosed. And of course, uh, thank you all for tuning in. Tune in next week, and uh, please share us where you watch us. Thank you so much, guys. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.